Greetings. My name is Gregory Pierce, and I intend this to be the third video in my potentially long series on the perennial philosophy. In my first video, which is mirrored on the channel Kimberly Bunch, Kimberly Bunch and I discussed uh, both Twin Flames and Exhortation to Philosophy, uh, respectively. And we related it to our experiences with one another and with spirituality. In my second video, I made a very brief presentation quite quickly on relating the psyche, the Greek word for soul, to the world cosmos, the world order, uh, through a hierarchical view of Logos, which is the reasoning in language. Uh, because a very large portion of the perennial philosophy is to release the self from inferior programs of conditioning that deceive the soul and the appetites of the soul. And so in this third video, I had decided that the topic would emphasize virtue and appetite in respect to developing the perennial philosophy, which is the tradition of perseverance toward absolute truth and virtue. And this topic, even this portion of the topic, is not a topic that is easily, briefly, rightly discussed in its entirety. But it is an important topic. It is not one that I see very properly discussed in the common uh, use of language among people. And a lot of assumptions can be made about virtue without taking into account epistemology and Uh, various uh, situations that the soul may experience. And I don't expect to get into a great deal of that in this video. This video is more an attempt to establish a place to start, a healthy place to start to, to advance through ethics. Again, in the prior videos, and especially the first video, I discussed my motivations for this series on perennial philosophy. And in the second video, I was setting out to show the principles and applications of language and mind uh, quite quickly in a way to bring about a consensus Bring about a consensus, I'm sorry, I have quite noisy neighbors and I'm going to try to close the window. Please give me a brief moment. I usually like the charge in the air that comes from a moist atmosphere, but I don't want the noise to interfere. In the second video, I was trying to develop a, a consensus of how to reflect on language and in the process of belief, or developing and exercising belief uh, in respect to the soul in daily life and regarding life and death. 
So, in this third video, I have not meditated too much uh, today on what I am going to say. I did not write a, uh, a written presentation as I did in the previous video in this series. What I have done is I have selected a couple quotes to begin with that are written by members of the Platonic philosophy nearly 2,000 years ago. And I've done this to partly to show what they believed and partly to uh, discuss it uh, quite by instinct. So I will begin with the more ancient of the two quotes that I especially picked out. And this is by the philosopher Atticus. Now, just a brief moment of background on this. I am currently in the process of reading a book written by the scholar Lloyd Gerson called Aristotle and Other Platonists, a 2005 publication. He, in that book, advances an alternative thesis on Aristotle's relationship to Plato. So, like, like Gerson says in, I believe it is his introduction, any thesis, any argument that is advanced has been contested elsewhere. Uh, controversy is not an easy thing to escape. And that was a topic in my previous videos that opinion is very is very common. Uh, it tends to contest with other opinions, but I believe there is a way to advance to true knowledge. And so, to do that, we have to start quite simply. And regarding Atticus, whereas Gerson was advancing a thesis built on the so-called Neoplatonic belief in a basic harmony between Aristotle and Plato, and Gerson was describing what that is and why. Atticus is a philosopher of the so-called Middle Platonic period, in other words, between Cicero and Plotinus, so about 2,000 years ago, who himself is famous for writing on the differences between Aristotle and Plato because he is emphasizing that Plato does very well at expounding doctrines, perennial doctrines, in fact, that show how the human soul achieves its purpose and its happiness uh, on an ontological ladder to the world essence. And Aristotle In his writings, although there may be points of harmony in places that can be identified, Atticus focused on expressions of Aristotle's natural science, uh, especially regarding human behavior, that did not emphasize, but rather expressed distance from Plato's own ethical emphasis based on epistemology. And so, and so I will begin by reading a quote from Atticus uh, relating ethics to philosophy for purpose of the perennial philosophy. And so the quotes I have are on this uh, particular laptop. Okay. Translation is not mine. I do not translate Greek, at least not yet. It would be nice, perhaps, one day to do so. Now, the fragments of Atticus, they are written in Greek, and I believe that the particular fragments are extant through 
the writings of uh, of a certain Eusebius that was a librarian in early Christianity, a very early Christian scholar. And see, Christianity, like many like many uh, cultures of belief, many religions, many ideologies, has changed. I don't want to say it has evolved. I don't really believe it has evolved positively. It has changed uh, in popular culture, in fact, quite rapidly, quite often, and over a long period of time. Eusebius was a scholar who utilized an understanding of some of Plato's uh, points of doctrine uh, to speak against other pagans, other pagan philosophers, or not so much philosophers, but other pagan worshippers, uh, in that he tried to show that Plato's doctrines were had a certain harmony with Moses' doctrines, uh, because Plato was uh, essentially a monotheist, even though Platonists also tend to be polytheists, uh, because of the nature of their metaphysical system. I'm not going to discuss much of Christian Platonism in this video, uh, but for example, Marsilio Ficino, where other Platonists will say multiple gods under the Most High God. Marsilio Ficino will simply emphasize angels given powers and stations under the Most High God. Uh, but uh, the point is that these fragments are preserved by a Christian scholar nearly 2,000 years ago uh, who was very well educated in the common uh, higher thinking, higher educated thought of this time period. So, I will read perhaps roughly two paragraphs of Atticus. Very introductory paragraphs. Atticus is a distinguished Platonist who goes through his doctrines in his work against those who undertake to reconstruct Plato's doctrines through Aristotle as follows. That was Eusebius, and, and now this is Atticus. Philosophy, and we mean the perennial philosophy. This is me talking, uh, because the goal of these ancient priests and the Platonic philosophers in those days saw themselves as priests and the Pythagoreans and Egyptians and Chaldeans before them and the Brahmins, they see themselves as priests of a very spiritual and eternal tradition. They, their concern is not state wealth. Their concern is not uh, social popularity amongst people. Uh, their concern is not their egos. Their concern is to experience the correct worship of God. And so, as it truly is, and to prove it to themselves. And so when they say philosophy in those days, unlike today's sophism, in those days they, or at least Atticus and like-minded philosophers, are speaking on the perennial philosophy. And so Atticus says, Philosophy as a whole, then, is divided in three. That is, into the topics known as ethics, physics, and logic. The first of these, ethics, makes individuals virtuous, reforms whole households, and what is more, organizes the citizen body under an outstanding constitution and the most precise laws. So it organizes uh, individuals, families, and states with one another, ideally. The second topic leads to the knowledge of things divine. This is physics. Those that are themselves principles and causes, 
and those others which come about from them. Plato has called this inquiry into nature in his Phaedo. The third topic governs judgment and discovery in both of these spheres. It is clear and everywhere agreed that it was above all Plato who first brought together and unified all these parts of philosophy. Now this is, uh, this point is a common statement by Platonists, but it is not a universal statement by Platonists. Uh, some Platonists, like Proclus later, held the divine Plato in such high regard as a, uh, as a scientist who brought a literary beauty uh, to these doctrines, but nevertheless it is a common thing among especially Neopythagorean Platonists who saw Plato as merely writing down doctrines that had been long developed in its in its, uh, in its largest portion before himself. Until then, these doctrines had been scattered and flung about, like the limbs of Pentheus, as someone put it. Plato showed that philosophy was a kind of body with its own organic integrity. People are not ignorant of the fact that followers of Thales and Anaximenes and Anaxagoras and everyone else of that period worked only at investigating the nature of what exists, nor has it escaped anyone that Pittacus and Periander and Solon and Lycurgus, Lycurgus, I don't know that name, and their like put their philosophy at the service of the state. Zeno, the Iliadic, along with the whole Iliadic movement, is known for his particular devotion to the science of arguments, dialectic. Plato came after all these. He was by nature a genius, fresh from his initiation, as if actually sent to us from the gods, so that philosophy could, through him, be seen in its organic integrity. He left nothing out and perfected everything, neither falling short in what was necessary, nor carried away into anything useless. Uh, what I want to emphasize from that paragraph, aside from Atticus's praise of Plato, is the is effectively the unity, integrity of philosophy, and his division in three parts of philosophy, ethics, physics, and logic. So continuing. Well then, since we have said that the Platonist partakes in every part of philosophy, as someone who discusses physics, ethics, and dialectic, let us examine each in turn. It is universally understood among philosophers that philosophy as a whole holds out the promise of human happiness, and that it is divided in three, reflecting the creative distribution of the universe. So there's much that can be said about the ternary and the triad, but right now the emphasis is on happiness and ethics. Our peripatetic, in other words Aristotle, will be seen to be so far from teaching any of Plato's views in these matters that, although there are many who differ from Plato, none will seem more posed than he. First of all, Aristotle effected a shift away from Plato in the greatest and most important field common to all philosophers by failing to observe the measure of happiness and disagreeing that virtue is sufficient for it. He parted company with the power that virtue has and came to think that it needed the favors of chance or fortune before it could capture happiness. Taken on its own, he complained, virtue was powerless and incapable, incapable of attaining happiness. This is not the right time to show what is ignoble and wrong-headed in his opinion on this or any other matter. But what is quite clear, I think, is that the views of Plato and Aristotle hold on what one is aiming for, and that the nature uh, and the nature happiness are neither the same nor alike. 
In other words, that Plato and Aristotle hold different views on uh, the nature and aim of happiness. Whenever he mentions it, Plato shouts and proclaims that the happiest man is the most just. Aristotle, on the other hand, won't allow that happiness is a consequence of virtue unless it has the good fortune to coincide with birth and beauty, and gold as well, like the Homeric verse, he goes toward dressed in gold as a girl. Necessarily, then, as their view of the end differs, so the philosophy that leads there is different as well. For it is not possible for someone walking along a road that leads to something petty and base to come by that same road to what is great and exalted. Okay, so my point there is, is basic thesis that Plato asserts that the goal of philosophy really is happiness, and that this happiness is a true happiness of the soul, and that the happiest man is the most virtuous of men, regardless of anything else. And Aristotle, Atticus claims, is saying that no, the happiest man not only would need virtue, but he would only be happy if fortune granted him a measure of wealth and beauty and various other kinds of goods. And later in the thesis, later in his arguments, Atticus expands on all these points. He says, he notes the differences of the, the many in Aristotle and the one in Plato. Uh, he says here that of all the things that conduce to happiness, the greatest and most important is faith and providence. This above all keeps human life on the right track. And so none of these things are, can really be isolated and stand on their own, uh, but they are the necessary elements in a in the integrity of a fully functional uh, human soul and human being. So, on that point, before I say too much about it, I would rather continue by offering a quote by a later Platonist who lived several hundred years later, a very excellent philosopher. His name is, again, I'm not searching the pronunciation, uh, Demascius or Damascius? I would say Demascius. I, but more specifically, the successor to Isidore, successor to Marinus, successor to Proclus, Platonist. Uh, Demascius was a scholar the last scholar of the Platonic Academy of Athens, which closed about 1500 years ago from today in this video. And so, Demascius, he expands and revises the doctrines of his predecessors, but, but uh, much of what he takes is from his predecessors, and one of the one of those he admires most is the so-called divine Iamblichus. Uh, per, my personal opinion is that if any man is divine uh, in those days, uh, that is about the third century A.D. of that century, uh, if any man can be called divine, Iamblichus is certainly among them. Uh, because uh, I find him to be most admirable, personally, for reasons that I may develop in another 
uh, video, but certainly in my writings. Now, Damascus, I'm going to I'm going to take, take this quote. It's from his commentary on Plato's Phaedo, and this quote comes from. I might have a copy of his Phaedo commentary, uh, but there is a book called The Golden Chain. Actually, there are two books called The Golden Chain. One is by a scholar named John Dillon, which I'm not referring to, uh, but he is a very good scholar and translator of Platonic philosophy. There's another book called The Golden Chain uh, on Pythagorean and Platonic philosophy by a certain uh, Algus Uzdevanus. I don't know his the exact pronunciation of his name. The golden chain clearly refers to the chain through history of the perennial philosophy. And I have a quote on virtue from Demascaius that uh, is very relevant to the perennial philosophy. It has very much to do with purification because the point of Virtue is purification in the in this philosophy. Demascaius writes, One who is purifying himself and endeavoring to assimilate himself to the pure must in the first place discard pleasure and pain as far as possible. Secondly, the food of which he partakes should be simple, avoiding all luxury and it should also be in accordance with the laws of justice and temperance, that is to say, free from the taint of bloodshed, and with divine command and ancestral custom for a diet that, in defiance of religious law, offends against animal life and coarsens the vital spirit, will make the body unruly towards the soul and unfit to enter into contact with God. Thirdly, he must suppress the aimless motion of irrational appetite, what indeed could arouse desire or anger in one who has disengaged himself from all external things? Nothing is the point. But if anything on the con if anything of the kind, irrational appetite, should ever stir in waking or sleeping, he must it must be quickly quelled by reason. Fourthly, he must detach himself from sense perception and imagination, except insofar as it is necessary to make use of them. And in the fifth place, the man who wants to be set free from the plurality of Genesis must dissociate himself from the multifarious variety of opinion. The sixth and last precept is to escape from the complexity of discursive reason and seek the simpler forms of demonstration and division as a preparation for the undivided activity of the intellect. So I will go over those points a little bit, and I may expand further into that line of thinking. Okay. So Regarding, so while I'm speaking, the whole purpose is of this engagement is that you may be compelled for purposes of survival or, or defense of your beliefs to do things in life. But uh, you have a responsibility to yourself to return to the tending care of your soul, that part of you which is born of eternity, has a relationship with eternity and allows you to inhabit this world which draws generation by derivative action from eternal principles.
in this sense, you also have a a limit a a degree of a measure of ability to direct your exercise of virtue day to day and year to year. Virtue not only external but internal. And so, you know, external virtue. There may be various opinions of such things. Uh, it has very much to do with etiquette. And doing what you know is proper to another. Inward virtue is really where you're going to derive your ability to attain to knowledge, true knowledge, and to overcome opinion, dangerous opinion. And and so Atticus in that in those quotes he emphasizes that Plato divine and wise in understanding the ways of the eternal world over and ruling over the phenomenal world, which is the sensible world of generation and corruption that imitates eternal laws and beings. Happiness will not be found by an instrument of the body alone. The body has various instruments to serve the soul. It has the stomach, it has the tongue, it has the senses, it has the gonads, it has the muscles, it has the bones, it has the lungs. There's all these various instruments in the body, none of them will bring happiness, right? The soul has various parts to its structure. The inferior, the inferior parts of the soul will not bring happiness. These things that allow you to utilize the instruments of the body, these things that allow you to engage in industry per se, or, you know, sensible science, perhaps, or uh, collective political action, or survival in uh, you know, many of these things, the, the inferior parts of the soul that translate emotion, that translate simple thoughts or simple translations of what is around you, these things, whatever pleasure that you may associate with them, the associative parts of your mind, these things do not necessarily bring happiness. According to the philosopher, what brings happiness is that the deepest and truest and most wholesome part of you returns into union with your fundamental purpose of cooperating with eternal life, eternal being. to experience the correct worship of God. In order to achieve this, again, Atticus complains that Aristotle suggests that with Aristotle, in opposition to Plato, the claim is that happiness requires multiple elements of experience. Wealth, so that you can exercise a freedom to survive, a freedom to choose a measure of comfort and a measure of personal choice. Beauty, 
You need a measure of beauty so that you comprehend something to live for, something to something as a therapy for yourself. But what's more is that Aristotle is suggesting, according to Atticus, that these things are coincident with chance, or rather uh, fortune in such a way that the world chooses to an extent if you are happy by the manner in which you are near to happiness. And Atticus says no. Atticus says that Plato's doctrine is this. To become the most perfect of human states of experience, the soul possesses what it needs. It merely needs to become wise enough to exercise its powers, which it can do of its own free perseverance its own choice. <sighs> Difficulties will happen. Tragedies can happen. But a common factor that feeds tragedy and that feeds pain and that feeds evil and ugliness and, and these sorts of things is is an amnesia of correct virtue. So as a result, Atticus says that Plato's doctrine is this. To achieve happiness, you must perfect a virtue. To perfect virtue means that regardless of what occurs in life, you develop the right harmonic patterns of response. This is both inward and especially inward and then, consequently, outward. Now, Demascaius, the quote I read to you of Demascaius, is actually, these are actually doctrines that are present with the curriculum of Iamblichus. And Iamblichus, these are Platonic doctrines, but Iamblichus emphasized that these are Pythagorean doctrines. These are Orphic doctrines because they emphasize to return to citizenship with the eternal world and to live in cooperation with eternal judgment eternal laws, the deepest fundamental and essential nature of the human soul, as opposed to conventional patterns, conventional opinions, and the incidences of sensible experience of fortune. If tragedy happens, the only possible, the, the best possible remedy will, will still include a pursuit of truth and a virtue that harmonically restores one's relationship to truth in respect of its unity with beauty and with good and with knowledge.
So I will review with myself the the six uh, the six prescriptions of Demoscaius regarding purification. And six is a good number because six is one of the most perfect of numbers. It is mathematically an example of what is defined as a perfect number. I mean, not only is 1 plus 2 plus 3 equal to 6, but 1 times 2 times 3 is equal to 6. In other words, that the factors of 6 are equal to altogether to 6. Uh, every tenth power, or forgive me, every power of ten has a perfect number, and between one to ten it is six. One who is purifying himself or herself and thus endeavoring to be assimilated into the pure, must first discard pleasure and pain as far as possible. This is the first dictum. Pleasure and pain they are indicators of experience but the problem with them is that they are so ontologically distant from the first principle that they can be used by the, the lower mind to create opinions that are removed from truth. If you feel pleasure about something, it may be invented. Or if you feel pleasure of something rightly, you can misapply the conclusion of meaning that you may draw from pleasure. You may, by misutilizing pleasure, you may move into excess of pleasure, where you neglect other parts of your other parts of your soul and other instruments of yourself, let alone your fundamental center of being. Pain is similar. You may experience pain. Natural pain is usually a good clue of something really bad. But pain can develop into false opinion. Pain can also become excessive or defective uh, in agency um, within your psyche. For example, trauma uh, derailing some harmonic patterns of thought into discord. So the idea is that since pleasure and pain are so distant from the Most High, because they are responses that we can easily associate as being fundamental to sensible to physical experience. And because they are primary ingredients to the thoughts of opinion, then they are unnecessary to the center of our being. To a great degree. It's not that we are not allowed to experience pain or pleasure. They are natural. They are clear, clearly natural. Uh, it is not saying that we neglect pleasure and pain altogether, but as far as possible. In other words, we drop all unnecessary attachment to pleasure and pain um, so that we do not pursue luxury and gluttony. We do not pursue hatred 
uh, when it is unnecessary. We do not allow our souls to be corrupted by something so far from the highest eternal principle. Because pleasure and pain are responses to a lower world. We have no need for pain when we are in immediate contact with the highest principle of the, of the universal world. And I'll be right back because I need to let someone in the door. The second dictum of Damascaius is the food of which the aspirant of purification partakes should be simple, avoiding all luxury. It should also be in accordance with the laws of justice and temperance. In other words, free from the taint of bloodshed and in accordance with divine command and ancestral custom. For a diet that, in defiance of religious law, offends animal life and coarsens the vital spirit, will make the body unruly towards the soul and unfit to enter into contact with God. So, this is a great example. This is aloe vera juice, pure organic aloe vera. It might be backwards. And, and it is easy for the body, and it is purifying to the body. What I have found, something that has been very much to my mind the past several months, in my pursuit of proper study and uh, philosophical life. One second. Is that if you eat the wrong foods, if you, eat, if you drink the wrong drinks, if you basically overwhelm the experiential body with discord, discordant experiences and discordant uh, properties of experience and uh, things discordant with the harmony of the body. You will overwhelm the ability to fully apply yourself to spiritual philosophy. You will overwhelm your ability to experience intimacy with God. You'll be distracted by discord by traumatic experience, whether you recognize it or not. If your body is sick, if your mind is full of fatigue, if it's in a haze, if you are closed off from being able to tune yourself to the most harmonic series of patterns of apex with the with your full sum of incarnation and from from above to below from below from below to above you are reduced you are removing yourself from philosophy so for me i do my best now to abstain from meat because whether it is acceptable to eat meat or not, the commercial meat tends to be tainted. I try to stay away from dairy, generally speaking, because commercial dairy, uh, according to my research, is poisonous. I try to purchase non-GMO uh, because 
GMO is another word for saying that they think that for the for whatever reason they're willing to risk changing natural DNA to whatever they decide whatever that is despite their ignorance so I try to practice health on a budget uh, aloe vera is not something I get every day uh, but it is very it's like a medicine you know it's uh, it's far more appropriate than 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 drinking syrup all day or in other words sugar uh, juice uh, dairy it's cleansing to the body so when Demaskaya says to adhere to religious law he is saying the law of God he is not saying Christian law Islamic law Judaic law Platonic law he's not saying conventional law that's not the way of purification per se but per se the law of God means to bring the self into intimacy with the Most High insofar as it is our natural our most intrinsic central self uh, possesses, the, possesses the capacity or the, its proper mode to do so. So in order to be released from evil experience, you need to reduce uh, all possible uh, conduits of corruption and evil experience. And part of this is to abstain from poison uh, and to discover therapies, harmonic therapies, uh, whether it's food, drink, music, aromas, these sorts of things. But Demoscaius, when he says to, you know, avoid defect, he also says to avoid excess. Because one of the dictums of Pythagorean Platonism is to abstain from luxury of the belly. Now this, it really depends on, you might have a different, you might have a different memory of experience with the body, but there are different states of experience you can have with, between the soul and the body. And when it comes to the stomach, the stomach will want food. And the body will tend to want pleasure. The tongue will tend to want taste, good taste, sweet taste. Um, but now more than ever, there is deception in our foods and you know uh, sweetness no longer means ripeness of nature as much as it means processing by uh, wealthy companies uh, of capitalism but more importantly more importantly for example on one extreme if you are fasting in periods that I have fasted, I did so as a way of expressing a love for God. Nobody else has to know you're fasting. If you are fasting, especially in the right circumstance, perhaps you'll know when, it is a, it can be a hymn to God. The reason for this is, on the other, on the other side of the spectrum, if you're eating constantly, if you're eating all day, you're eating every day. You're spending all your time uh, consuming food. It can distract you and it can distract your body. If you are fasting, your body can clean, can clean itself, especially if you're drinking properly. But you don't need to drink either so much. 
when you are fasting, what happens is, is that the body's appetites adapt. So it's really a way of following the, the dictum of the Oracle of Delphi in Greece, which was also the Oracle of Delphi had the same statements of law as the Egyptian temples, uh, for example, in On, Thebes. Uh, or Thebes, not Thebes, but yeah, yeah, um, Memphis. But the point is that the appetites can overrule the soul's ability to reach toward higher truth. The appetites are some of the easiest conduits of false opinion, especially when mixed with conventional programs, whether so-called reasons or so-called popular you know, beliefs, experiences, thoughts, common sense. By fasting, you are able to remind the body that it doesn't like so much sugar if you have been eating so much sugar. If you are fasting, you're able to remind the body that it does not need, nor does it like, excessive uh, ingredients uh, or excessive foods that you might have a habit of feeding to your body once you get into that state of overfeeding your body a certain manner of foods. So, fasting can be a way of cleansing the body. It can also be a way of cleansing the soul. Because your body, because now your soul is able to focus on loyalty to God, loyalty to knowledge, loyalty to purity, loyalty to healing, and it is able to overcome the deception of excessive and deceptive uh, and poisonous experiences that easily overwhelm reason through the appetites. And these are very serious things. That's why I'm spending so much time on them. And if it seems like too much time, forgive me. But contemplation and affirmation is healthy and good. And that's part of the purpose of this uh, a program of purification also. Thirdly, Damascaya says, the aspirant of purity must suppress the aimless motion of irrational appetite. For one who has disengaged from external things, is not easily aroused by desire or anger. But if anything of the kind should ever sit in waking or sleeping, if there should ever be any aimless motion of irrational appetite, it must be quelled speedily by reason. This is really the, the central uh, practice that Demoscaius is trying to communicate. In Plato's Theaetetus, Socrates arrives to a doctrine that, that you can have, with good reasoning, it's possible to have good judgment of something. You can have a, you can have a reasonable opinion of something. But opinions are still ontologically, that is in respect of fundamental being, inferior to those things which exist beyond other things which are apprehensible by knowledge alone. I don't mean facts like, you know, it's a fact that the sun is so far away or the earth is so wide or, you know, those are, those are not those are not principles of knowledge, regardless of what you believe. 
you know, you can say that your hand is, is a fact your hand is so big, but it's not eternal, it's not an eternal fact. Uh, it can change its size if you're a child. Uh, it doesn't last forever. And even if there, there is truth that is true for a moment, well, it can still be misinterpreted. And if you believe too much in it, whether it's true or whether it's not true, you could still be committing an error of reasoning, whether you admit it or not, that may actually be hindering you from a further truth regarding the matter. It could be that all your reasoning, based on all your experiences regarding a certain matter, are sound and good, and yet they still are not true because they have not pressed into another layer of investigation. Furthermore, on this point of the aimless motion of the irrational appetites, there's the inward and there's the outward. From the inward experience, the inward projective creativity, you may create You may summon programs of experience. You may create compounds of experience, whether it is to project sensible apparitions into your mind's eye, or whether it is to create a story of thoughts or feelings or images or perceptions. And these things, when they are not carefully guarded, if you acknowledge them, and if you don't apply a firm discipline of corrective programming to yourself, they can lead you astray from the principles of knowledge that harmonize the soul and that are working to purify the soul to, toward a proper return to the highest principle and the corresponding entity. So, furthermore, first denoting the external part of experience. There are those who will believe that whatever they are doing whether it is something that they are thinking or feeling, or whether it is something that they are saying or performing, they may believe that they, what they are doing is acceptable or justified. And they will have opinions of reason for this. Maybe they believe in the faction they belong to, or maybe they are angry with an opposing faction. Maybe they don't care about anything as far as they are concerned and their beliefs. Regardless of what they think or do, they can project things onto you and these projections have the ability to to affect parts of your programming, whether it's one kind of one kind or another. And and the, what the philosopher is trying to do, starting from within, like a tree, is he is trying to remove himself from the superf superfluous, the unnecessary, the and the toxic, right? But he's not going to be doing this based on people's opinions of common culture, of popular culture, of popular sense. He's going to be doing this, or she's going to be doing this, to love God's perspective of knowledge. To love knowledge's experience of knowledge. To love the world's experience of knowledge as it is from sky to earth, 
not between men who may or may not know things. That's what, that's what we mean by fundamental and essential knowledge. So, you, in your incarnation, especially when you incarnate into a realm that acknowledges mortal actions, but, but these mortal actions in this world and in any world derive their empowerment from superior immortal principles, especially according to Platonic and Pythagorean doctrine. You may spend your energy moving your soul through a convergence of various properties, various compounds of experience. But if you are not of the greatest sincerity toward purity, and you do not train yourself toward a higher efficiency of this sincerity of intent and its application, you may rightly perceive that these productive, these productions of experience are promoting distance from the most perfect method of developing the soul toward the eternal entities of eternal laws and eternal principles, whether it be knowledge or life or justice or beauty or those things that Plato calls the forms that are necessary to our soul or that are born in other words, that are born from pure intellect, that is unadulterated by false opinion, but that is inhabited by divine agency and is in substance of true knowledge. Now, so the point of Damascus is to do your best to destroy any part of yourself that is conductive of evil, whether it is immediate evil or whether it is immediate evil, which means it may not appear to you to be a greater evil, but it can be a lesser evil that is a parasite of good. These things, especially these latter things, can be commonly accepted by persons who do not exercise the purity of their soul with a view to knowledge. But even if these things become commonly accepted in common culture, they can be poisonous to the elevation of the immortal soul in the mortal body. The fourth dictum of Demascaius is that the philosopher must detach himself from sense perception and imagination, except insofar as it is necessary to make use of them. So, we've already been building up to this point. He's emphasizing that the sensible world and the sensible powers of agency and passion are derivative powers distant from the highest principle. Likewise, the imagination is an expression of the soul's agency that while not being unnecessary or improper for the soul to have, nevertheless in the mortal body, the imagination is experienced in coincident uh, 
uh, potential of contact with corruptive influence. And so Damascus is warning that if you attach yourself to sense perception, or if you attach yourself to imagination, and or if you attach yourself to perceptions, thoughts, that are adulterated with the, the assumption of love, pleasure, validity, knowledge, or immunity to sense perception, within sense percep perception, and within imagination, you are committing a flaw of knowledge, you are not adhering to the law of knowledge, and you are on the, and you are trailing off into uh, perhaps corrupting the soul's journey to return to the divine by correct worship of the, of the divine. You cannot worship the divine if you do not understand divinity when divinity is there. And you will not arrive to the face of God in your understanding, in your willpower, if you are adulterating your soul and your intellect with an over-reliance on the value of sense perception and imagination. It's not to say that these things are not important or not useful, but the Mesquias is saying that as far as possible, do not trust them when you are attempting to purify yourself with knowledge, because they lend to opinion, and thus more often than not, false opinion. Or if, even if they are true opinion, for example, if I think to myself, you know, the wall is white and it may indeed be white, if all I am doing is thinking to myself it is white, that may be a true statement, but it is not a true and proper behavior of my soul to think that it is okay to just say it is white all day long every day. That won't do my soul any good. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to remove yourself from dimensions of unnecessary behavior, and part of this is removing yourself from corruptive practices of how you acknowledge what knowledge is. If you acknowledge knowledge falsely, then you can develop behaviors that are not properly conductive of the soul's transmutation to purity. What you are trying to do is, is, is travel through the soul to the laws that are eternal, that God has established from himself. And by tuning the soul to these laws and to their harmonies, you are you are being released from the poisons of the body and, and preparing for yourself a, uh, an intimacy with God, a divine station of experience for the soul. And you are exercising corrective and correct worship of, of God and knowledge. The fifth dictum of Demascaius for purity and purification is that the man who wants to be set free from the plurality of, gener of genesis or generation must dissociate himself from the or herself from the multifarious variety of opinion. So that is something we have been building up to. 
And there's another quote I may find to advance on this. Opinion is basically the, the choice to participate in a configuration of your energy along the, the chosen fragments of linguistically included experience. In other words, one moment please for for proper speech. He is saying that you need to be set free from the plurality of generation. And to do this, you must be disassociated from the plurality of opinion. The basic point is that plurality is more distant from the highest principle than is unity. Okay? So, when the highest principle or and or a highest entity, the principle within the highest entity, or vice versa, when the most high governs the world and creates the world, his laws must apply to the whole world. It must allow him to be able to conduct his will from one far end of the universe to the opposing end of the universe in any dimension, and in every dimension. So, unity is closer to God than plurality, which is the principle of difference. And so, separation. So, Damascus is saying in the, through the words of Iamblichus and others before them, that you must, that, that the one who seeks purification is trying to be assimilated to the Divine One. And to be assimilated into the Highest One is to, first of all, is to grow the maturity of the soul, and likewise, thereby, therefore, become severed and separated from immature parts and fragments of separated pluralities, especially those that are not united to divine knowledge and therefore follow the modes of irrational appetite, false opinion, these sorts of things. I can give a very good practical real-world example. Political television. Don't trust a word they say. Uh, Partly because, and there are very many reasons why, but what I'm going to be emphasizing right now is they will often use words like, I'm right, they're wrong. You know, you're not a very good person if you don't agree with everything I say, and therefore I will, you know, throw your kind in, in jail and, and I will tax these people or these people, if they vote for me, then I like them, and so I will uh, give them all the money they want, and, you know, and these things will happen. Uh, but the point is that, that when these folks have a motivation 
and that they are producing um, a, an outlet of communication to promote their message and their message is not founded on unity with divine knowledge but their their communication is founded on pushing an agenda that is born of irrational appetite or false opinion then they are not going to be applying or appealing to your higher mind or your essential and fundamental design or will to return to divine knowledge they will be affirming fragments of communication fragments of perception to program in the mind patterns of experience patterns of agency that are resistant to and not conductive of divine knowledge and purification the philosopher in contrast for example the philosophers who for thousands of years have been persecuted murdered enslaved burned stabbed shot thrown under the bus ripped from their homes these sorts of things these philosophers they declare they are happy as much as they commune with God and what Demascaius is saying is that rather than being quick to trust modes of experience modes of self-agency that are conductive of plurality first and foremost especially to especially not by being conductive of unity because we are in a world that is both one and plural but what he is saying is that you will find best results if you arrange your efforts in a hierarchy that is aligned to the very same hierarchy that the layers of reality are built upon in the world as it is so that by emphasizing the one in all that you do they will be closer to the one and the more you comprehend the one and its laws and its divisions of re the plural reality within the unity of the world then you can harmonically respond within your world of experience to the world as it is and to the world of the original purpose designed for the human soul sixth and last precept the sixth and last precept of Demoscaius for the purification of the philosopher is to escape from the complexity of discursive reason and seek the simpler forms of demonstration and division as a preparation for the undivided activity of the intellect so our discussion has also prepared us for this dictum here what he is saying is that, is that the philosopher must escape by saying that the complexity of discursive reason you know what he is saying is things like you know when so-called scientists or mathematicians or uh, you know it's like when Nikola Tesla says that some of these scientists and mathematicians they design theories that are based in their own ideas but that are not based by experiment uh, another example is is to you know focus when you when you focus 
so much of your thinking on moving from partial thought to partial thought, or plurality to plurality per se, and you forget to return to the one in a circular procession and reversion of reality back to the one, you, your, your form of agency and experience will become increasingly distant from the one. Discursive, you know, an example of that, the discursive level of reason is beneath the, what, what the Platonists call the intelligible world of reason. The intelligible world of reason, the intellective world, the intelligible, the, the intellectual world that is purely unadulterated of lesser derivative uh, uses of the intellect in, in inferior worlds is the intellect of the divine mind, the divine intellect that rules over the law of the world. It is contemplating things toward a unity of harmony. In such a way that these things are, each of the things contemplated are pure, they are simple, and they have very simple relationships to each other. And when you exercise discursive reason too much, you can lose sight of the simple. By focusing on the simple, you are reminded to center your efforts, to center your efforts on the center of your intrinsic self, to the center of the world, to the center of God, to the center of eternal good, to the center of proper effort. And when you align yourself to what this is, which is called efficiency, you are cleaning yourself from the inefficiency of knowledge, which is ignorance. And so, by conducting purity, you are restoring an intimacy with divine knowledge. Now, to elaborate on all these points, I will remind the audience of a doctrine stated by Alcinous, the Platonist, at about the time of Atticus, 2,000 years ago, that he derived from Plato's Phaedo, if I can find the quote. And so, Plato's Phaedo is Plato's central text on the immortality of the soul in respect to the soul's necessary relationship with knowledge regarding the purpose of the soul and of the world. I'll start from the beginning of this passage. Alcinous opens thus on the philosopher. The following is a presentation of the principal doctrines of Plato. Philosophy is a striving for wisdom, or the freeing and turning around of the soul from the body where we turn towards the intelligible in what truly is. And wisdom is the science of things, both divine and human. 
That's the central principle. So, again, what he says there is that it's part of what the Mascaius calls the Bacchus, which I won't get into in this video. What Alkino says is the soul is part of the immortal world, and yet our body lives in a world that experiences mortal productions, mortal expressions of energy. And we have to remind ourselves, the philosopher most of all reminds their self that their concern is honoring the eternal world. If you love the flesh, if you love the appetites of the flesh, then you can find others who do the same. You can select a way of life that is commonly accepted and popular in the conventional society. You can prosper with your pleasures, with your perceived and your chosen pleasures. And then when you die, perhaps a moment will come when you realize you had forgotten to honor the eternal God. with all that you are. Because even for the philosopher, it is not easy to honor God with all that we are. Part of our experience is to labor toward proper worship of God. And the philosophers say that reminding ourselves to cooperate with eternal law. This means that we cannot get sucked into the common practices because they are common. Even if, even if it, these things are zealously supported. Because the actions of humans can be very easily corrupted. And they are corrupted by loving the mortal over the immortal. Even though the, because the mortal is derivative of and not superior to the immortal. You know, in the movie 1984, uh, perhaps also the book, I don't know. There's a quote that uh, the villain, who is trying to brainwash reality out of the subject, says that only the party, only the political party, is immortal. Nothing else is true. Well, this is obviously an inversion of the facts. The, it is not true that way. The political party is a construct which, at best, can imitate an immortal principle, and this is what Plato strives to do in his dialogue, The Republic, by discussing how the philosophers can worship the good, the immortal good. And yet, and to do this, to rise out of the world of shadows, right? You know, it's not just about, it's not just about saying that someone is right or wrong about any given thing. It's about how we live our life. Uh, Plato, who it learned all things Pythagorean, they say, declared that Pythagoras was famous for founding a way of life. This is something that I have meditated on this year.
quite a bit, is to focus on one's way of life. That each day, you do your best to rise above not only how the appetites can conspire with the world against the knowledgeable, the, the, the part of the soul that aspires to knowledge, but but furthermore that I don't want to be too dogmatic especially without the proofs in one in one sitting um, but but it's very important to understand that there are truths that are not commonly acknowledged uh, but these truths are best arrived at when you carefully practice certain truths in daily life on how, how to live uh, and these include letting go of any practices that in any direction conduct a distance from knowledge of the good and to remind the self that the good favors immortality and unity and immiscible harmonies. And that the lesser derives from the better, but does not equal the greater. I don't want to uh, press on the length of this video. The, the intent of this video this third video on perennial philosophy is to is to ascertain a fundamental starting point of how to really effectively condition oneself to be free from improper and alien conditioning. Uh, but furthermore, to restore one's intimacy through life uh, with and in harmony with death, with the eternal good. By, by loving virtue and by returning to the center of one's most essential and deepest self in relationship to the, to the world cosmos, being free from the appetites of the instruments of the, of the soul and of the body, so that you can master the instruments of the soul of the body, of the soul and the body, so that the instruments do not rule over you, nor the instruments of others. And in doing all this, one approaches wisdom and I believe that true wisdom can be truly found and and I have yet to see it politically expressed in this modern world so uh, I hope that that changes um, what I think would be a good alternative is for persons to focus on not only their individual selves but to build and preserve a tradition of the things that they love most to arrange the properties of what they love most for future generations from their self in the world uh, in a way, trying to guard the ideal faction 
uh, not only in their self, but with their friends and family as best as possible. Um, and do their best in all affairs, but additionally, to exercise honesty with God uh, beyond all other pursuits of physical life. That's what I feel is most productive, is the honesty with the Most High. Uh, I don't feel there's anything further I meant to say in this video. Uh, I think I have went a little bit over that, actually. Uh, I think the discussion of the quotes was all that was necessary. And uh, I'm not sure why I continued any further, but I'm finished. So, thank you. I do have other ideas for videos. I also have further ideas for my writings. I've been delayed lately, but I'm glad to get this done. So please stay tuned. And, and, uh, and thank you. Uh, you can visit my website. I also encourage you to visit the website of Kimberly Bunch, uh, the best the psychic medium I, I believe I'll, I will ever know. So thank you and goodbye.